Matthew chapter 8. And what we're looking at today is the cleansing of a leper. And uh, you see that in verses 1 through 4. And so let me read to you Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, and we'll get into our study, the cleansing of a leper. And, and really what this is, this is a message that, that is saying to us as, as uh, people today, we can be clean, we can be clean. Beginning at verse 1, Matthew 8, reading to verse 4. When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one, but go your way. Show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So in order for us to understand what's going on, we need to do a bit of a review. We need to remember certain things. Because if you'll notice with me, in verse 1, it, it makes a statement when he, speaking of Jesus, had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And so the question we would begin with is why were multitudes following the Lord Jesus Christ? The answer would be found earlier in Matthew in chapter 4, where in verses 23 through 25, Matthew had written, Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee, from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So people were following the Lord Jesus Christ because of his ministry, because of his, his ability to, to heal and the miracles that had been performed. They were also following because of his powerful preaching and his presence, because of his authority. We had seen in chapter 7, verses 28 and 29, how Matthew said, So it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So they were following him because of the power that was evident in his ministry, in his preaching, and in the miracles that were being performed. They would hear him as he preached, they heard him as he taught, and they were astonished. They were dumbfounded by this man. It reminds me of what it says in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 50, verse 4, related to Messiah. How it says in Isaiah 50, verse 4, The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. And so many people were following him. And for many, the question would be, but where does this authority come from? Now, that is a question that was actually asked of him when he cleansed the temple. In Matthew 21, 23, it says, when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And so, though he's speaking with authority, Still within them is the question, where did he get it? Who gave him this authority? Well, the answer is he received his authority from his father. The authority that Jesus preached with is, is established by his words as well as his works. His words and his works were consistent. And as he would speak, he would tell them, this is where my authority comes from. In John 3, 34, it says he's sent by God. He speaks God's words for God's spirit is upon him without measure or limit. In John 14, 10, he said, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. And again in John 14, verse 24, he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. My words and my works verify or establish my credentials. So Jesus' ministry was revealed through teaching, preaching, as well as healing. And the impact of his ministry, great multitudes followed him. 
Now again, we know that miracles were a large part of the work of Jesus Christ. They were part of how his ministry credentials were authenticated. When you read the Gospel of John, for example, in chapter 9, John 9 records the healing of a man who was born blind. It was such an amazing miracle that even his neighbors couldn't believe that this is the man that they knew. So the Pharisees, the religious leaders, didn't want to believe that this had really happened, and so they asked this man a question. How did he open your eyes? And in John 9, we read in verse 32 and 33, the man's response. He said, since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And so Jesus' miracles authenticated his ministry. As we get into chapters 8 and 9 here in the Gospel of Matthew, we're going to be seeing several examples of miracles performed by Christ. And so I want to lay a foundation for you so that as we enter into chapter 8 and we see all of these miracles, you can see how they're built on a platform. Because the question has to be asked, why did Jesus perform miracles? I mean, it wasn't for entertainment's sake. It wasn't because, just because he could. There were reasons behind his miracle working, and they weren't done in, in such a way as to entertain people in, in that sense because there was a particular false gospel that was written you know, after the true gospels had been written, and, and in one of those false works, it speaks of how Jesus, as a child, would fashion um, birds out of dirt and then cause them to fly. And they used to give stories like that concerning Jesus, which were not true. Jesus didn't do things like some magician to entertain. He didn't do them so that, that people would look at him and, and uh, misunderstand his mission. There were reasons that he performed miracles. Let me give you four reasons. I want to lay this as a foundation. We will be looking at the cleansing of the leper in a moment, but I want to give you this as a foundation. Four reasons for Jesus performing miracles. One, they proved that he wasn't simply an ordinary man. The miracles that Jesus performed proved that he was not simply an ordinary person. In John 14, verse 11, he was speaking to one of his men, Philip, and he said, Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father's in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. The evidence of the miracles themselves. They prove he's not an ordinary man. Second, they demonstrated the nearness of the kingdom of God. In Luke chapter 11, verses 19 and 20, Jesus said, If I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they, therefore shall they be your judges. But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. So one, he's not an ordinary man. Two, they demonstrate the nearness of the kingdom. Three, they demonstrate the compassion of God. A lot of people don't understand the love of God. They don't see it. The world that we live in, in many ways, actually mitigates against you believing that God is actually compassionate and loving. Jesus' miracles demonstrate that God is compassionate and God is merciful. In Matthew 14, verse 14, Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And so he was not an ordinary man. They demonstrated the nearness of the kingdom. They revealed God's incredible compassion. And again, they established his divine credentials. In John 5, 36, Jesus said, The works that the Father has given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And so the Lord Jesus Christ performed works, and in the performing of these works, established his credentials and revealed the compassion of God, demonstrated the nearness of the kingdom, and revealed he's not just an ordinary man. What we have here in Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, is the cleansing of a leper. And so notice with me in verse 1, it says he had come down from the mountain. So Jesus has come down from this mountain where he had given the Sermon on the Mount, and the result is the multitudes are following him. Now, more than likely, they're simply curious. They've never seen anyone like him, and so they're pursuing him out of curiosity, not necessarily because they want what he has to offer, as much as this is a very unusual man, and they want to know more about him. 
And it says as this is taking place, verse 2, Behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Behold. Now that should cause us to take a moment to think because when he says, and behold, he's simply saying this is something unusual. This isn't something that you would expect. Behold is another way of saying this is out of the ordinary. Behold, a leper. Now, why would he say a leper came and worshipped him, but preface it by saying, behold, a leper came and worshipped him? Well, lepers had nothing to do. They could have nothing to do with those who did not have leprosy themselves. Leprosy was the most feared disease in the ancient world, and this form of leprosy was incurable. Because they had this kind of leprosy, God actually gave commands relating to the disease in the Bible. And the commands that he gave the nation of Israel that related to this form of leprosy are found in the Old Testament book of Leviticus, chapter 13. Somebody wrote of the 61 defilements in ancient Judaism, leprosy was second only to, to touching a dead body. So the thing that would make you unclean first and foremost is if you came into contact with a dead body, but the second would be is if you had leprosy. Now the Old Testament teaches when leprosy was present that lepers were to do certain things. You see it again in Leviticus 13. They were to tear their clothes. They were to cover their mouths because it was a contagious disease so that the disease would not spread. And they were also to go about crying out the words, unclean, unclean. And so if you had leprosy, you were to do those things. You had torn clothes, you'd cover your mouth. And if you saw anybody within a certain distance, you were to warn them by crying out, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. During the time of Christ, the Pharisees, who were so self-righteous, some is recorded that, there were times when some would pick up rocks and throw it at the leper to keep them from approaching them. So here comes somebody, you have to see this here, somebody would be coming into the village or whatever, or come into contact really with you, and you'd see them at a distance, and they would have to, by law, cry out and say to you, I am unclean. There was a man by the name of L. S. Heisinga. He wrote a book on leprosy, it's called Unclean, Unclean. And this is how Heisinger describes leprosy. He said, leprosy generally begins with pain in certain areas of the body. Numbness follows. Soon the skin in such spots loses its original color. It gets to be thick, glossy, and scaly. As the sickness progresses, the thickened spots become dirty sores and ulcers due to poor blood supply. The skin, especially around the eyes and ears, begins to bunch with deep furrows between the swellings so that the face of the afflicted individual begins to resemble that of a lion. Fingers drop off or are absorbed. Toes are affected similarly. Eyebrows and eyelashes drop out. By this time, one can see the person in this pitiable condition is a leper. By a touch of the finger, one can also feel it. One can even smell it, for the leper emits a very unpleasant odor. So leprosy. Leprosy in Scripture is a graphic illustration of sin. You see, like sin... Leprosy infects the entire person. It starts as a small sore, but it spreads. You see that in Leviticus 13, 2 through 8. So it's a type of sin. Psalm 51, verse 5 says it like this, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. It begins small, but it consumes you. It's part of your nature. And so leprosy was ugly, it was corrupting, contaminating, smelly, and it desensitized people as well as alienating them, which is like sin. Now obviously babies are born with a sin nature, and eventually the nature of that baby is revealed in their activity. And when unchecked, 
It becomes a thing that identifies a person. I mean, we have babies and our babies are born and we bring them home from the hospital and we think they're the cutest, sweetest thing in the world and indeed they are. But they have a sin nature. And eventually that baby's sin nature is going to erupt. You're going to see what that baby's all about. If you don't think your baby's a monster, just withhold something from it. If it wants something, it'll let you know. If it's unhappy with you, that baby may even reach out and, and hit you. I mean, if it, you know, the little snarly monsters. I mean, if they, if they could consume you sometimes, they would do that. And, and, and it's funny because I took a lot of classes. One of my majors in school was sociology and psychology. And so when I was going to college, one of our, in our classes, they would, they would argue about the origin of bad behavior. Most of them were saying they either were a blank slate at that time or or perhaps you learned this behavior. And, and those who theorize that you're learning these behaviors because you're a blank slate, they're not parents. They're not parents. You know, some of the best parents I've ever met, some of the best parents I've ever met are those who don't have children. <laughs> they have other theories. Some of you are parents, and you've had people who have no children telling you how you should raise yours, haven't you? Oh, you ought to do this, and it all... And how do you know you don't have a kid? Well, I'm an uncle. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You don't have a kid. You don't understand. And that's a fact. And so a lot of times people will say, oh, this is what you ought to do. And, oh, that baby is just a sweet little. Now, where would that little monster get their disposition? It's their sin nature. It's their sin nature. And when unchecked, that sin nature takes over and demonstrates its presence. And it may even identify that person by the behavior because it's going to produce fruit. So that person, that baby that is so sweet and lovely and all, may one day be an alcoholic, may one day be caught with drugs, may be one day promiscuous, may be one day a very angry, angry child who grew into an angry adult. You see, this leprosy was contagious to others, and it was spread through contact it was spread through contact, which is, again, similar to sin, because you can actually teach others to learn new sins, or you can help them to sin and not get caught. Somebody may tell a lie, and an accomplished liar is there listening to him tell the lie, and they'll say, you know what? You shouldn't have embellished your story the way that you did if you'd only said this. You can actually teach people how to lie. Some of you, when you were young and you were in high school or whatever, you, you taught your friends how to get away with doing things by telling them, oh, if you'd have done this or you should have done that. We, as sinners, can actually teach other people how to sin. And it actually can be encouraged in other people. You know, there are websites that have been set up to provide alibis for those who are cheating on their spouses. Some of you are aware of that. Others may not be. I'm not going to give you the names of them. But there are. Where if I pay a certain fee to a particular website, and I plan on having an affair over the weekend, I can contact this particular organization, give them the information that they need, then I give my wife the uh, supposed name of the hotel I'm gonna be staying in for that weekend, and I give her the phone number, and if she needs me, she calls this particular phone number, which is not a hotel or motel at all that I'm staying in for business, but actually is just this organization. And there's somebody there who has the information on, on record. So when the phone call comes in, they open up the record, they see my name, and they're able to say, oh, he's not here right now. And they act as if they're the hotel or motel that I'm staying in for business purposes, when in reality, I'm not there at all. And they actually help people to sin and commit adultery by providing alibis for cheaters. It's something that spreads. Like sin, leprosy results in isolation because those with leprosy were not to be around other people. In Leviticus 13, verse 46, it says, All the days he has the sore, he shall be unclean. He is unclean, and he shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Sin makes separation. Sin separates. First, it separates me from God. Isaiah 59, 2, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Sin makes separation. 
But not only am I separated from my God, I am also separated from other people. Sin does that. Sin will actually cause me to be isolated from other people. You know how sin works even in your home if you're, again, if you're a married person and you have an argument with your, your spouse. There's a separation, a relational separation that occurs until that sin issue is dealt with. Maybe you got mad about something and you had an argument and you both get quiet and then, you, then you're going to show them so you sleep on the couch and, and all and boy, I'll show you. I'll sleep on the couch, which is actually doing them a favor because they don't want you in the room anyway. <laughs> and you're banished to the room with the big TV and the refrigerator just a few steps away. <laughs> but you're going to have that isolation. It's going to be there. Or if you're a parent and your kid does something, there's a, there's a distance that occurs until the resolution, until the I'm sorry's and the reconciliation reconciliation comes about. If you have a friend that you have an argument with and you stop speaking for a while, there is a separation. Sin makes separation. Separates you from God, separates you from other people. Leprosy resulted in isolation, and sin does. In the same way, you feel alone. Not only that, but like sin, it desensitizes a person to pain. Do you know that somebody with this form of leprosy could actually stick their hand in a fire without knowing it and burn their hands terribly? But because they have no sensors, no way to feel pain, they would injure themselves without even knowing that they were. It desensitized them to pain. They could be cutting something for a meal and actually cut their own finger off and they wouldn't feel it because the nerves had all been killed. You know that sin makes you desensitized. Here's something for you that some will say, oh, that's an old-fashioned thought, but let me give to you it because it's a biblical thought, not simply an old-fashioned thought. Somebody once said this, and I agree with them. They said, this is a society. This is a society that we're living in right now. By the way, I have great hope for this society. The gospel changes lives. But the bottom line is, this is a society that doesn't know how to blush. That's true. We live in a time when people are not ashamed at doing the things that they do. They're not ashamed of it. We actually give awards to those who really should be ashamed of the way that they're living. We give them awards. We say you're very courageous for coming out and telling us what you really are and how you really feel. Whereas at one time we'd have said to them, you know, I, my heart goes out to you. I have compassion for you. How can, I, how can I help you to deal with this? Because you're obviously greatly troubled. Now we simply award them. We reward them. We give them TV shows where they can do their lifestyle on TV. And, and that's what this society does. We have uh, today, and again, I don't want to come off in such a way to sound like, oh, you know, this guy here is... You know, he, he wants to live in, in the 50s. No, the 50s were bad too. What I'm trying to say is we as a society have stopped blushing. We don't even know what the word shame is anymore. We don't feel ashamed. We do things, and you know what? Even Christians will do things that they ought to be convicted and feel bad about, but if you say what you've done is, is not honoring to the Lord, what's the first thing that they'll tell you? They'll say to you, stop judging me. Stop judging. This is the grace of God. And, and no, 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 sweetheart. The fact is, you're not reading your Bible, are you? Because Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. You obviously are not keeping his commandments because you're in this particular sin. He wants to set you free from it, but he's not going to reward you while you're in it. And leprosy desensitized the person. They no longer felt pain. And like sin, you can practice sin and become good at it to the degree that it becomes your lifestyle and there is no shame. All you need to do is remember one of the sins that you were told never to do and you finally did that sin and try to remember what you felt like after you did it the first time. Did you feel proud that you did that? No, what you felt was shame that you did that. You felt shame because you should feel shame. But if you do it the first time and you seem to have gotten away with it, you'll do it a second time. 
When you do it the second time, you'll do it a third. When you do it the third time, it becomes a habit. When it becomes a habit, it becomes a lifestyle. When it becomes a lifestyle, it's just the way it is. And that's how a lot of people are. They don't sense any shame. According to Hebrews 3.13, the writer said there, exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And finally, leprosy was incurable outside of a touch by God. There's no medical cure. All the priest could do is wait and see if it cleared up. You see that in Leviticus 14. Sin is also incurable outside of a touch by God. And so what we have here is a leper taking a chance and approaching Christ. And it is because he knew that the Lord would welcome him. Notice how it says in verse 2, Behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. This man came and he worshipped him. He showed great reverence to him. It's a picture, the word in the original language is a picture of a dog bowing before its master, licking its hand. That's what the word means. And so he's humbling himself and he's showing reverence to him and dependence on him. And so what we see here with this is though leprosy is a type of sin, we see that this man knew that he could come to Jesus and not be rejected by him. You might want to mark that in your heart. You can come to Christ and not be rejected by him. So a man by the name of Simon has a dinner party and he's well known in the community, and he invites this up-and-coming rabbi to his house so that he can speak to him, see some things about this man called Jesus. He has Jesus in a special place, a place of honor there at the table as they're reclining in their meal. And as they're communicating, and Jesus is ministering to this man named Simon, the Bible tells us there's a woman who comes in Whenever there was such an affair, the community would be welcome. And so this woman, as part of the community, was not to be rejected. She was to be allowed to come in, and she did. And as she walks in and she goes to the area where this dinner party is, and there's Jesus there reclining at meal with Simon, as she's looking at him, she begins to think within herself, some things about what Christ had recently done. And it causes her to begin to become emotional. She starts to weep. And as she's beginning to weep and she's starting to walk towards Christ, all the sounds of this dinner party and all the people who are standing around watching this as it took place, it's almost like there was a gallery of people watching as Jesus is there reclining at meal, having communication with Simon and the other guests. Here comes this woman pressing herself through this crowd of people, the crowd begins to notice her, and the crowd noise begins to dull and finally ends, and here she comes. She stands over the feet of Christ as he's reclining and begins to weep, and as she weeps, the tears begin to drip down her chin onto his feet, and she kneels down, and she takes her hair, and she dries his feet because she has noticed that she has taken her tears and, and dripped those tears on her feet, and as she does so, and she's holding his feet, out of love for him, she kisses his feet. And Simon is watching this. And he says, if this man truly were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is that's touching him, for she's a sinner. Simon was a Pharisee. And he was basically saying, this is a woman that everybody in this community knows is, is a prostitute. Everybody knows that she's a sinful, sexually promiscuous woman. Everybody knows it. And how can this man who's supposedly a prophet, how can he not know what she is? Simon, Jesus says, I have something to ask you. Stay on. Well, there was a man who had two men who owed him some money. One owed a great sum, the other a lesser sum. But the man who was owed the money completely forgave both of those who owed him money. I want to ask you a question, Simon. Who would love him more? Well, I suppose the one who was forgiven more. In this you have rightly or correctly responded. 
You see this woman? Which to me, it's important to see what Jesus is saying because as a quote, he said, you see this woman, because to Simon, she wasn't a woman at all. She was an it, she was a thing, she was a sinner. She was a test case. You see this woman? And then he says, you didn't give me a kiss of greeting. You didn't anoint my head. You didn't wash my feet. The three basic customary things that Jews will do to guests. You didn't do a single one of those things and yet she's anointed my head. She has kissed my feet. Simon, though she has great sins, they have been forgiven. Because the one who is forgiven much loves much. Here's your question. How much have you been forgiven and how much do you love? How much have you been forgiven? Listen, here's something for you. To all, all of us should remember this. I try to remember this often. Do not, do not forget where you came from. Do not forget where you came from. Do not forget that you may very well have been the person that others are saying, that person can't be saved. That's such a mess. That, that is a hot mess. That person cannot be saved. They're just too far gone. Because guess what? There may have been people who were saying that about you, and now you're saying that about somebody else. There's nobody so far from the love of God if they will come and receive what he has to offer. And a leper like this man came up to him, and he saw that he would not be rejected. He came to Christ because the Lord welcomes those who would come to him. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. He was drawn to Christ as we are drawn to him. And so a second thing is he humbled himself by bowing before the Lord and called him Lord. Remember, pride will always result in you remaining in a broken condition, but humility will result in healing. If, if, if I were to say, oh, I'm okay the way that I am, it's just who I am, I cannot be healed. But when I get to the point of saying, I need help, I can be helped. It's like that time when, when Jesus is there and, and Matthew has made him a, a meal and, and there are people, there are friends of Matthew. The only people who would come to such a meal by this man were, were people like him. And so here come these publicans and here come these sinners, but... Once again, the Pharisees are there. They see what's taking place, and they speak and say, why does your master have a meal with publicans and sinners? And, and the Lord Jesus responds, only the sick will go to a doctor. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You see, the Lord has a way, keep that in mind always, of reaching into the lives of the sinners. The self-righteous ones who think they're okay the way that they are, they can't be helped. You can't be helped. It isn't going to work. You need to recognize that you need help. Or you won't be. You're going to just continue on. And by the way, to be helped requires a humbling of your own heart. God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. Proverbs 3.34 says, Surely he scorns the scorners, but he gives grace to the lowly. So he humbled himself, and that's what we need to do. We need to come to him, and we need to humble ourselves. And then he said, Lord, if you're willing, I have a confidence in you, and I know that you are capable, but I also know that you need to be willing to. If you're willing, you can make me clean. In 1 John 5, 14, John said it like this. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Lord, I'm coming to you as a sinner, and if you're willing, you can cleanse me of my sin. And Jesus can do that. Notice he placed his faith in him. You can make me clean. When you think about it, you need to remember again that in the Old Testament, a priest could not cleanse. A priest could only pronounce that cleansing had taken place. A priest isn't the one who cleanses because they all knew that only God could cleanse a leper. They knew that. And so if God were to have cleansed them, all the priest was to do was pronounce that he's cleansed. So when he comes and says to the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, if you are willing, he's saying you are much more than simply a man. You are the person that can do that work on my behalf. Psalm 103 verses 1 through 3 says it like this. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. 
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. And so we know that no man can forgive me of my sins. No man can cleanse me. It takes God. It takes the Lord to forgive me of my sins. No man, but God himself. We remember the story of a man who was crippled. and He was on a cot. And he had four friends who brought him to Jesus. They couldn't get into the place that Jesus was teaching us in this house. And so they climbed the stairs on the side of the house. They went to the top of the roof. And there was a, a, a flat roof area there that they broke open. And then they lowered him. They put ropes on each one of the corners of this cot. And they, they lowered the man down, working in unison till the man was lowered into the presence of Christ. And then Jesus, looking at the man, said, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, wait a minute. He didn't even ask for forgiveness of sins. This is a man who's on a cot. He needs to be healed so that he can walk. And yet the first thing that Jesus does is forgive his sins. And so there are those who are there listening to this take place. You all know the story. They begin to speak amongst themselves. Who is this man who can forgive sins? Only God forgives sins. And in that theologically, they're 100% right. Only God can forgive sins. Which is easier, Jesus says, to say to this man, rise and walk, or to say your sins are forgiven you. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he turns to the man and he says, I say unto you, rise, take up your pellet and walk. And the man walks, wraps up that pellet, and walks out, healed by God. Who can forgive sins but God alone? The, the leper was cleansed by God. And so you need to see the connection that's being made here when the leper is saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean. You can make me clean. Uh, notice with me, leprosy isn't spoken of as being healed. It's spoken of as being cleansed. You can make me clean. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's what God does, if you're willing. And you know what the Bible tells us? Jesus' response, I am willing, be cleansed. You mean you didn't make him jump through a lot of ritual hoops, a lot of religious mumbo jumbo? You, you, mean, you mean you just said, yes, I'm willing? And then what does he do? Well, verse 3 says he puts out his hand and he touches him. I'm willing, be cleansed. In this gentle, loving, compassionate way of Christ, take this home with you today. Please take this home with you today. This will keep you in times of struggle. Always know one thing. God hates my sin, but he loves me. He loves me. He hates my sin so much, he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross to set me free from its bondage. He hates it. He is holy. He cannot look upon sin with pleasure. Thus, he had to do something in order to, to eradicate the gulf that was between God and me, the, that separation, that issue of separation, which my sin, my sin has made a separation, and God doesn't want to be separated from me. He created me that I might enjoy him and have fellowship with him, but my sin made a separation. And so what the Lord did is he reached down through the hand of Christ, and, and when I said to him, you can clean me, you can cleanse me, you can do the work in me, he said, I am willing. If anyone comes to the Lord, he will not cast them aside. If you come to the Lord, when the Holy Spirit is drawing you and you come to the Lord, he will not cast you aside. He's not going to say, oh, no, there's somebody over there more important, somebody I like much more than you. Frankly, you irritate me, but I like that person. He's not going to do that. He loves you. Please walk out knowing that today. Please understand that God so loved the world, and that world includes you. Does he love your sin? No. He hates your sin. It put his son on the cross. Jesus died on the cross because he hates your sin because it results in death and eternal separation. He's there, Jesus, at, 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 the, at the tomb of a friend by the name of Lazarus. And the Bible simply says, it's a short word, Jesus wept. Jesus knew what he was going to do. 
He knew when they came and told him, your friend Lazarus, whom you love, is ill. Jesus knew what was going to happen. He knew all of that. Why are you weeping, Lord? Because of what sin does to people. Look at the sorrow. Look at the pain. Look at the loss. Look at all of these tears that are because of sin. He hates sin. We ought to hate it too, by the way. When we play with our sin, it has been said it's like kissing the tip of the spear that was plunged into the side of Christ when we enjoy our sin. And so, oh, you know, it's no big deal. It's, it, it is a big deal. It's why Jesus died on the cross to set you free from it. If you're willing, you can cleanse me. And Jesus' response, I am. And he reaches down and touches him. Why? Because our God is merciful and compassionate. Isaiah was writing prophetically of Messiah. The Old Testament book of Isaiah in chapter 53, verses 3 and 4, and speaking of Messiah, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised. We esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities, carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. Lord, I feel rejected. Jesus says, I understand. Lord, I feel pain. Jesus says, I understand. Anything I go through, because he's, he's man and experienced those things, he relates to. Whatever I go through, they're, they're gossiping about me, Jesus. I understand. That's the Savior. That's one of the reasons why when I come to him, I, I know he understands my heart. What kind of life had this man lived as a leper? Well, we know he was alone. He was isolated from others. He was fully aware of his diseased condition. Leviticus 13, 45 and 46 says, the person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothes. Let his hair be unkempt. Cover the lower part of his face and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone. He must live outside the camp. Now because of the Lord, no longer is this man isolated and no longer is he alone. The symbol of living death has been dealt with. He is now restored to community, to sacrifices, to the right relationship that he wants with God. Again, that's what happened to us when God touched us. Like a leper, we were once the living dead. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 says it like this, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. You were dead. We were zombies if you were the living dead going through life, rotten, putrefying, smelly, rejected. But we heard Jesus, and we cried out, and we said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. He heard us, and he cleansed us, and now we're new. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, once again, that word behold, isn't this amazing? Any man in Christ is new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I was in a class in college. Class is yet to start. We we're waiting for the professor. I was in the, in the classroom. Another student sat across from me. We didn't know each other. We began to converse. The man speaks to me and he says to me that he's an alcoholic, that he's been going to alcoholic, alcoholic anonymous kinds of classes and all. And he says, you know, and I've been sober for, for a while. And I smiled at him and I said, I was an alcoholic too. He says, so once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. I said, no. I said, no. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 
I said, I once was an alcoholic, but now I'm new in Jesus Christ. And he says to me, oh, you've had the conversion experience, because it was a secular college, conversion experience. I said, conversion experience? I was born again. It's not a conversion experience. I am converted. I am brand new in Christ. You see, I don't call myself a recovering alcoholic. I am a recovered alcoholic. I am a covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, new creation, because I was the leper who fell on my knees before Christ and said, God, if you're willing, you can cleanse me. And he did, because that's what God does. He washes you and makes you new. You don't go back to it like the dog returning to the vomit. You follow Jesus Christ because he gives you newness of life. That's Christianity. That's the Christianity. And so Jesus speaks to him and says to him in verse 4, See that you tell no one. But go your way, show yourself to the priest, offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. In other words, don't hesitate along the way. Do exactly what the law of Moses commands. You need to do the law. You need to fulfill the sacrifices. Because in doing so, you're going to have to explain to the priest how you were cleansed. And you will be able to tell him, Jesus cleansed you. And that's going to force the priest to acknowledge a miracle has been performed by Jesus Christ. Which is why when somebody has a miracle, a miraculous healing, it's always wise for them to go to the doctor and to have a checkup so that the doctor will say, well, this, you, you had cancer or you had this condition or that. It, it's gone. I can't understand how that happened. And then you say, I can't either, but I asked the Lord to touch me, and it appears to me that God did. It's a witness to them about what God can do. And so as this former leper was to offer sacrifice and to force the priest to acknowledge a miracle had been performed, even so, we are living evidences of the cleansing power of God. We are living evidences. The only people this leper actually knew, if he had any community at all, were other lepers. So I'm certain that he, after having his cleansing validated and all, as a testimony, I'm certain that he told the other lepers, there's one who can cleanse you. Everyone in this room who's been saved, every one of us who's been cleansed by the blood of Christ, we have the same responsibility, to be a living testimony of the work that God does. Does that mean that we're perfect? No. Does that mean that, that we're not going to fail every day in word or thought in deed? No. You know, I, I, I've been walking with the Lord for, for some time. As a matter of fact, this month, this month, September, I celebrate 40, 42 years. I started teaching the Bible in September of 1973. I've been teaching the Bible now for 42 years. I've been a Christian since December of 1970. I'll be celebrating 45 years of walking with the Lord, 45 years of being a Christian. And, and no, and no, I am nowhere near what God wants me to be. So please, please never think that I think I'm better than you because I am like you. I am like all men and all human beings. I'm a leper in need of a cleansing hand from Jesus. I just haven't forgotten it, and I never want to. I always want to give praise to the one who cleanses us, don't you? I want to give praise to Jesus Christ for the work that he does. So tell somebody else, let people know in this world that has no hope, and it shouldn't because it has no God, we have hope because we have God, we have Jesus Christ. God has sent you out as a cleansed leper, as a cleansed leper to be a testimony of his grace. May we live in such a way that he is honored.